Good morning. Our next speaker will be Pas uh, Smets. Um, Pas Smets is a landscape architect uh, with an office in, in Brussels, and he will present uh, three of uh, their projects. I first encountered the work a couple of years ago when I, I went to uh, Brussels to see a, a house by office, uh, Kirsten van Geers, and I was um, inspired, amazed, when I, I saw the garden of the house. It was nothing, not a real garden, it was a, a sunken landscape, in a way. And unlike many landscape architectures that I've seen so far, which are more um, kind of an Umraumgestaltung, a way to design what's not the house, this was um, a, a space, a place which gave a voice to the terrain, to the land to what is there before architecture comes. Uh, so I understood actually that architecture or the house is not detached from the land, but it's almost a continuation of the crust of the earth, that it could be considered a piece of, of, of geology. So that was my, my eye opener, uh, making, not only looking at something, if we, if we uh, recall what uh, Barbara just said, but, but seeing it. Uh, through the device of landscape architecture. What's the relation to hope? Probably landscape architecture is the discipline which is now the most changing, the terrain where the biggest transformations are happening, and they're not yet really visible and really clear, but they're uh, in transformation, and that's, I think, why we, why we need to uh, particularly pay attention to landscape architecture. It's great that we have Bas Smets here with us. Welcome, Bas. Hello. Can you hear me? It's a true honor and a real pleasure to be here, to be part of this, and I want to thank the curators at EAT, and especially like Christina, for having invited me. Alexander von Humboldt, when he went to explore the Americas, he brought his instruments with him, and he tried to measure all the parameters of the natural environment. He would take altitude, he would take latitude, he would take humidity, wind speed, even the blueness of the sky with a special sinometer. He would write all of that down in these beautiful images and trying to understand the natural environment as an interrelated, interconnected uh, entity. And for me, he's a very inspiring person because he would make his sketches and he has this designerly way of thinking through drawings, trying to understand how things are connected and how they work. And it's a true inspiration because I'm asked not to explore natural environments, but to intervene in artificial environments, in man-made environments, where we need to bring nature back in some way or the other. And for the last 15 years, we have worked on about 450 projects and we've built 45 of them in 12 countries. Um, always thinking back of understanding reality in a different way, looking at it and seeing it. Looking at it as if it is a microclimate, understanding man-made environments as a microclimate in which um, plants can be brought back. And we'll share with you three projects to uh, illustrate this. The first one is in Paris, in La Défense. More man-made artificial microclimate is not possible um, than La Défense. And I was asked by a promoter um, to work on the site next to the Grand Arche and the Knit. Up there, where you see the construction going on. We're actually on top of an uh, urban boulevard that goes into the, the belly of uh, the Esplanade. A smart uh, promoter was able to locate, I think, about a thousand micro foundations to build a bridge on top of that boulevard and a skyscraper on top of that bridge. And he had asked me to come up with a design for that bridge-like structure that actually uh, uh, makes a connection with the Esplanade that's elevated to um, the, the street level, lying 12 meters below. 
And I was thinking, how can you make a landscape, how can you make a public space in such an um, artificial climate? And I was thinking, what kind of climate is this actually? Everything is mineral, there's a lot of wind, there's a lot of reflection from all the glass buildings. So I thought, it looks like a mountain. It looks like a mountain, but the thing that's, that's especially um, comforting uh, at the mountains, and, and you have that view outside here, is the tree line. The altitude above which no trees grow. Because when you're walking in a mountain and you're in the trees, it's a very different experience than when you're uh, on, on the, 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 the stony side. And so I thought, can we introduce a tree line in La Défense? Because the tree line is also, it, it appeals to our um, corporal experience. As we, we are still animals and we know where the tree line is. So we decided to plant as many trees as possible on this uh, floating deck, reading it as if it was a natural situation. So we, we thought, let's plant as many as possible. What are the constraints? Of course, you cannot plant on the beams. You cannot plant on the fire lanes. You cannot plant on the uh, um, uh, ADA accessibility. So we made a kind of a map of unplantable area and unplanted as many as possible. The promoter had told me, that in his deal, um, I had the obligation to plant at least nine trees. So we ended up planting 50. 50 trees that create a, a continuous uh, a canopy, and they are planted in only 53 centimeters of soil. I had to negotiate for two years with a structural engineer to get those 53 centimeters. Every centimeter was a fight, as you can imagine. And we had to prepare the trees two years beforehand in the nursery to have flat uh, root balls. We put sensors to know the humidity in the soil, so we know when we have to give extra water. 53 centimeters, but spread out over 4,000 square meters, so 2,000 cubic meters of soil in which the trees can grow. A bit like in the mountains, where trees' roots found their way within the cracks of the, 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 the rock. Two years of negotiation, in the end we drew the structural scheme ourselves. Um, you can see the columns, the beams, the, the earth that is, that is continuous, and we drew these metal cages in which we would anchor the trees, not touching the waterproofing of the, 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 the structure. Continuous soil and big granite slabs lying on the beams, not crushing the earth. We worked hard to not have any details, so you have a kind of abstraction, as you can see here, the trees are growing um, through these this, uh, this holes, but of course underneath there's a fertile slab that is totally uh, continuous over those 4,000 um, uh, square meters. The stairs are in stone, the, the soil is in stone, the railings are in stone, it's all stone, and within those stones is growing this canopy, this new tree line uh, for La Défense. This was built uh, four years ago, we'll need a couple more years in landscape architecture, you need time and for this to become a continuous canopy. From Paris, we go to Arles. Arles and the Parc des Ateliers, where Maya Hoffman, president of the Lumo Foundation, had asked uh, Annabel Zeldorf to renovate the industrial buildings, had asked Frank Gehry to make a new one, and had asked me to make a park um, on the Parc des Ateliers for the visitors of the Luma Foundation, but also for the people of Arles. Now, for those who had been there um, three to four years ago, it was a difficult terrain. It had been cut out of the bedrock by the, the, the French uh, railway engineers to have a total flat area. There was no earth, no water, and no vegetation. And furthermore, the the the, the the concrete slab would absorb all the solar heat. And here we were in a microclimate, we made measurements, microclimate of a semi-desert condition. And for those that visited it uh, these years ago, you would go from one exhibition hall to the other, and you would have a headache because you were work, walking on a heated plate. Uh, the the, 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 the semi-desert temperatures, the perceived temperature would go up to about 45 to 50 degrees. So when Maya asked me to make a park, I thought first we need to make the change the climate. And so we started exploring Arles and, and, and the region, and there was this um, interesting contrast between this, 
the sterile slab, this perfect horizontal slab um, made by the, by, the, by the engineers, and a very rich landscape, a very rich nature um, around the site. You had the Alpi, the rocky uh, uh, branch of the, of the, the southern branch of the, of the Alps. You had the Cro, with an impermeable layer in clay, and you had the, 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 the Camargue. Um, with all its wetlands. And, and we thought these three bioregions give you all the strategies that plants have developed over years to deal with both mineral hot um, environments and wet, windswept environments, as you can find in the Camargo. So we thought from the beginning, can we use these strategies to make a new kind of landscape? And in discussions with, with Maya, but also with Hans, with uh, Philippe Barreno, we were thinking, can we make a living organism on this, um, on this concrete platform? And instead of designing it, and it took, it took us time to come to this, um, this solution, instead of designing it, the main question was, what would nature do? 100 years from now, 200 years from now, 300 years from now, how would nature come back, and can we accelerate those natural processes? Of course, you have the Mistral wind coming from the north. We had all the wind studies uh, around the, the, the Gary building, and we took these as a cue to imagine a topography that would be made with sediments coming from the Swiss Alps, all the way down the Rhone to, um, to the site. Topography means different environments. Different environments means different types of plants, different types of microclimates that can be created. And so we dug where we were allowed to dug. We dug about 1 meter 50 deep, and we went up 3.5 3, uh, 3 meters. We sculpted it by the wind, and there was a very interesting climatic section where in summer you would lie on the soft slope in the shade of the trees and having the breeze from the north, while in the winter you would be in the sun, protected from the winds by the same uh, hill. And so this asymmetrical profile we applied on the whole side, and then we looked at depth of soil, because since we were on a concrete platform, the only soil that was available is the one that we brought. And this is a very interesting scheme, because with depth of soil, you go into a new um, uh, ecological succession, which means that when you walk through the park, and the, 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 the earth is building up, you go faster in the future, because these pine trees would only come in 200 years. So there's a new space-time relationship um, by adding the soil uh, on, the, on, the, on the side. Water is taken from a nearby canal, um, pumped into a lake, filtered, and then used for irrigating the plants. And this section resumes the, the collective intelligence that was needed to make the park, working with the hydrologist to, 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 to understand how water can be pumped into the, 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 um, the basins that filter it, working with, uh, um, working with climate engineers, Transolar, to understand how we can really make this perceived temperature go down, um, working with pedologists to make the, the right constitution of the soil, working with botanists to uh, finalize the 140 types of plants um, that we planted on the site. And so with Transolar, German climate engineers, we worked on the, on the, the different parameters of the, what is called UTCI, Universal Thermal Climate Index, which is basically what you feel as a body. And we lowered the perceived temperature from 45 degrees, um, as it was before, to about 25, 28 degrees. 20 degrees difference in perceived temperature by the introduction of 80,000 plants and this, uh, this water body. And so these schemes were made by Transolar from 30% comfortable time in the summer before the project. We go up to 65%, and when there's a bit of wind, it's even better, 77%. These are hours uh, in a month uh, in July um, and, and, uh, and their, their perceived temperature. And so from this sterile platform, we come to this project. I'll do that once again. From this to this, without really designing it. I mean, the design follows really the, the logics of orientation, logic of wind, logic of depth uh, of soil. And these are recent pictures, so it has been in place for a year and a half now. And you start to understand this, this um, this living organism that's almost <coughs> autonomous, it doesn't need us, it allows us to come. Only one-fifth of the park is lawn on which people can sit, 
All the rest is plants, um, um, plants and animal life. And you see elements of the Camargue, you see elements of the core, but in a new kind of hybrid landscape. And I like this, this picture. This is taken of Carsten Huller's um, seven sliding doors, where you feel this kind of new hybrid landscape. Even here, you see the reflection of the wet Camargue, and behind it, the pine trees of the Alps. And at some point, Philippe Arinot called it a, a Frankenstein of a landscape. And with him, we made this, this, this kind of rabbit hole into the park um, with the with dark um, vegetation as an inverted topiary and also a clan d'oeil to the, the movie for which I had made the, 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 the set, Continuously Habitable Zones, that, uh, that Philip had made. We, put, uh, we designed ourselves um, uh, botanical uh, um, uh, uh, plagues uh, since we planted 140 thousand, uh, sorry, 140 different types of plants, 80,000 of them. Um, we thought it becomes almost a botanical garden. Schools can come and you can understand which plants we uh, have planted. In summer, the park is, is, uh, is much used. And it has become almost as if it always had existed. And from this experience, which is really a complicated uh, experience. It was a real adventure um, to, 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 to come to, to, um, to its finalization, but we, it, we, we learned so much about how to make a microclimate, how to take into account all these, uh, these parameters that decide perceived temperature. And we took that with us. Oh, one last thing. When I told Maya from the beginning that I would calculate the success of the park by the number of migratory birds that would come to the site. And, and with the Tour du Valais that her, her father started, we do a count every year, and this year we have counted 36 new species that have come to the, to the park. So we're now we're putting up bird's nest to, to, uh, to augment uh, that number. So this experience we took with us when we did the competition for this last project, the Notre Dame uh, of Paris, um, where we assembled a team, an interdisciplinary team, with the architects Grau and NGA, and the technical officer, uh, Angerop. We won the competition uh, last uh, July, and we based it really on this climatic uh, approach. Victor Hugo um, wrote in his book, L'île de la Cité est le berceau de Paris. The Ile de la Cité is the cradle of Paris. It's here that the city was started. It's here that urban forms were developed, buildings were, were invented. It's here that Paris really grew from this epicenter. And what's interesting is that you, when you go through history in a couple of slides, you see that the form of the island is changing, the urbanism is changing, and in a sense, we felt that the Notre Dame is like a privileged witness of a city looking for its form, of a city in constant transformation. And when the city asked us in this international competition to rethink the public space around the cathedral, we thought we have to rethink the city. How do we prepare the city for the 21st century? How do we deal with climate change that's coming? How do we make public space? We looked at what was there, kind of fragmented uh, elements from a parvis, placette, alignement, square, berge, parc. All the typologies that characterizes the public space of Paris were present around the cathedral, but in a kind of unfinished way. And so we thought, can we rethink those figures, urban or landscape figures, um, but think them from a double angle, from a collective angle. We just came out of COVID, so we thought, how can we bring new uses to the public space, not only for tourists, but also for the Parisians to, 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 to discover this space anew. And a double angle, the climatic angle, how can we make these figures so that they produce a better outdoor comfort, so that they produce a lower perceived temperature uh, in summer. We worked with Frank Boutet uh, on the climatic approach. Um, they made a very thorough uh, analysis of the existing UTCI, this perceived temperature on site, and how we could use parameters to lower it. But first, two observations. The main axis running from west to east uh, uh, of the cathedral, going to the east, is the same as the water coming from the east and flowing to the west. So, 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 so a beautiful double axis that is 
mirrored on the north with the facades of Hausmann and to the south with the Seine. And this was important for us because it, it gives you the geographical scale of the cathedral standing on an island. And secondly, the space in front of the Notre Dame is exactly as big as the one in the back, except that you don't notice it because there's two fences on either side of the road that crosses the, the island. So this scheme was important for us where we were looking for this generosity of the space, the generosity of the island of the Seine that has made the valley that has, that has designed the Paris. And at the same time, understanding that, that, that the, the cathedral is lying in between this parvis and this square. So from a, a very precise um, reading of the existing situation, we thought, can we give the parvis a better form, a more clear form, as wide as a cathedral, as long as a cathedral? Can we rethink the little plaza in front of it as a, 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 a place where we can provide shade? Can we think the back of the cathedral as one park, making a direct relationship between the, the chevet, the, the eastern facade, and the Seine? Can we continue the trees in front of the Hotel Dieu um, in the Rue uh, du Cloître? And can we make a linear park 400 meters long next to the Seine, uh, running all the way to the memorial uh, for the martyrs of the deportation. And so these five figures became the, 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 the way to transform the site and also the way to, to, to invent um, um, this climatic approach. So the, parv the parvis is understood as a clairière, as a, as a clearing um, in front of the facade adding trees on either side and also in the, in the front, which means that we have a lot of shade for people visiting uh, the cathedral. Instead of standing in the middle of the plaza uh, for three hours to enter the cathedral, as, as is the case now, people can uh, stand in queue in the shade of the trees. The, the perception of this clearing is made by positioning the trees, but if you're in the middle of the plaza and you look to the right, you still have a view towards the Pantheon that you see uh, up there. There was an existing uh, parking garage that was built in the 70s um, and that needed to be transformed into a visitor center. This is uh, what Grau and NGA uh, worked on. Here you see the construction, you see Notre Dame through the hole um, before they, they poured the minus one slab. And the architects decided to go back to that idea, taking out the minus one to have the double height ceiling. And we positioned the stairway towards Notre Dame, so you go in into this uh, uh, underground passage which you see here, that gives a new access to the, the Roman um, archaeology museum, and it opens up to the Seine to the right. So the light does not come from above, because we didn't want to disturb the feeling of the parvis, but comes from the Seine. And what's, uh, what's, uh, we worked hard on, 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 on this staircase, which we positioned exactly where the, the buildings used to be, which means that when you walk out, you're obliged to read the cathedral as it was uh, intended, from the bottom to the top, bringing your gaze to the heavens. The view from the, the bridge, and here you see the opening uh, that's hid uh, in the, 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 the wall uh, of the Seine. The 400 meter long park, where we imagine uses like the, the typical parks uh, in, uh, in Paris. And then here the tip of the island where you have this openness from the flying buttresses, the, 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 the tainted glass windows, all the way to the Seine with a beautiful view on the Ile de Saint Louis. So we bring in trees, we, we double the number of trees um, for uh, um, evaporation, evapotranspiration, so lowering the temperature. The problem was the parvis itself, which needed to be uh, unobstructed, 4,000 square meters. There was no um, volume, but also no a load that we could add because the Roman crypt is lying underneath it. There's 270 events uh, every year. So we, we invented a new um, device, which my daughter will show you. It's a trickle of water that can be activated and it runs down at a slope of 1.5%, 1, 1 creating ephemeral reflections of the cathedral and instantly cooling the temperature, the perceived temperature, by 5 degrees. Um, because you cool the soil, of course, you cool through evaporative cooling uh, the air. It's the same effect 
After summer rain, you go outside, you feel the air is cooled uh, by this evaporative cooling. And this is based or inspired by the, the, the way um, streets are clean in Paris. At 6 in the morning, they open these valves, and there's this special réseau d'eau non potable that cleans the streets. We uh, store rainwater um, in the underground parking lot and use that um, to activate this uh, um, thin layer of water. Uh, we're just studying now how many times we'll use it. It'll depend, of course, on temperature and humidity. We're also studying if we can use the rainwater that falls on the roofs, because there's, of course, an enormous roofscape um, that is being built uh, uh, right now. We studied in detail the perceived temperature um, around the cathedral, looking for the potential um, of making these microclimatic experiences. The Notre Dame is one by itself, it's always cool uh, in the Notre Dame, but we're studying how we can use the wind that comes with the Seine on the Parvis, how we can block the wind on the northern side of the cathedral, how we can use evaporative cooling on the plaza, and how new trees will add uh, uh, to the outdoor comfort. And so here, in detail, we studied the, the, the potential uh, refreshments that we can add to the, to, the, to the surroundings. And so with that, the, the um, Il La Cité becomes an Il de Fraîcheur. <laughs> with this, I would like to show the little video to end. Well, it's a little animation we made to explain how we think that if we read the built environment as a new type of nature as a new uh, ecology. We can imagine, or we, sh we should imagine, the, the built layer. Go ahead. We should imagine the built layer as the interface between what's above and what's below, the interface between a changing meteorology and an uncertain meteorology and an unknown and, and not well used geology. And I've called this biospheric uh, urbanism. And I've started last week, actually, uh, a design studio at Harvard to, to, uh, to explore this more in detail. Because to come back to the... to Hoffman, to hope, it is my profound hope that if we are able to transform our cities into microclimatic ecologies, that we can do two things at the same time. We can limit the, the, the cause of the climate crisis and we can mitigate its effects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Bas, for this uh, wonderful introduction of, of your work. I only wish that you would have done the design of the garden of the extension of the Zurich Kunsthaus. <laughs> uh, but there's always hope. <laughs> uh, we have, uh, it's part of the ritual of the Engadin Art Talks that we're also a little bit behind schedule, uh, so we'll be quick one or two questions. You already uh, said hope for the, um, uh, the um, uh, contribution to landscape design towards reducing the uh, effects of the climate crisis. Uh, you just started teaching at Harvard GSD. Um, wh what is your hope for the coming generation of landscape architects and architects? I think it's to, to, to look at the city as to understand the city as something that needs to be transformed, that should be transformed, and that can be transformed. And so I think for maybe for too long, this, the city was seen as, as it's there, and we can add little things, but I think we should profoundly change uh, how a city works. And so uh, this biospheric urbanism, to give it a name, um, is this idea to, 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 if you go back to a city, a city is built close to fertile ground, because you had to provide uh, your food, close to water. It's only the last 50 years that, that it has expanded so much that we have cr created this impermeable layer on top of that fert fertile ground. We can demineralize, take that layer off, and plant trees back into the city. So, th so I think it, it's, it's not that complicated. It's just that we put so much stuff uh, in that fertile ground, from metro systems to, to water supplies to, to gas. But if we, we should almost make a kind of an urbanism of the underground, 
or organizing all that into a, a more uh, designed uh, um, system to again find that, that fertile ground, plant trees, because those trees will allow the rainwater to be stored where it falls and to bring that back into the atmosphere. But we should do this as a, at a massive scale, almost beyond design. And that, that's, that's where it becomes interesting. It becomes almost like a systemic approach to transform the cities. Yeah, I found uh, impressive your, your comparison of the trees in the Alps, which have difficult conditions, and the tree on your concrete slabs on the plateau, uh, which also have difficult conditions. How do you proceed uh, as a designer, as a human being, uh, to kind of take over the perspective of a non-human being like a plant. It seems that you, you put yourself in the condition of, of wind and, and roots and plants. So we, we have this discussion with Stefano Mancuso, who's a, um, a, a bio neurolog, uh, and, and who, who wrote, wrote this fantastic books on, on how plants uh, communicate, uh, how mycelium and mycorrhizal networks uh, make, make a, a connection between, uh, between the roots. And so we, we're trying to use that latest knowledge in the way we design our projects. And how do we do that? It's, it's, it's beyond indigenous plants. It's, 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 it's beyond what we used to do, but it's, it's about looking, again, at a, a piece of, of, a, of, a, of the city as a microclimate, understanding with what natural situation that corresponds, understanding how plants adapt to that situation and bring those plants in that microclimate. Thanks. Uh, big applause for Bas Smits.